greetings to all of you. My dear sisters and brothers and my dear friends, a warm welcome to all of you from your past Yeti. On earth as it is in heaven, the Lord's Prayer teaches us to pray. Welcome to all of you. Today we're going to talk about citizenship, your kingdom come. It was a sad day in the history of Israel when the elders fired the godly prophet and prayer warrior Samuel and asked God to give them a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. It should have been the other way around. Israel was appointed to be a people who live apart, and the Gentile nations should have been begging Israel to share with them the truth. The truth about their great God, Jehovah. The neighboring nations had sanctuaries, but only Israel had the glorious presence of God dwelling in their tabernacle. The nations had laws, but Israel's law had been handed down from heaven. Israel's neighbors prayed to man-made gods who were powerless to help. But the God of Israel is a living God who heard his people prayers and answered them. According to Judges 1 and 2, Israel was a bad example and a poor witness to its neighbors. So, we shouldn't be surprised to see Israel imitating the pagans, nations, and begging for a king. Since the day of Abraham, the true and living God had been their king. And now the elders wanted to replace Jehovah with a weak, fallible human being. Listen to all that the people are saying to you. The Lord said to Samuel, It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. This was the first of three rejections in Israel's history that ultimately brought about their worldwide dispersion and the destruction of their temple. But more about that later. The Lord wanted Israel to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, but they disobeyed him and became more and more like the nations around them. And today, the church has the calling of being a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possessions. But are we living up to these privileges? It seems to me that the church is more and more conforming to the world instead of converting the world. Like ancient Israel, we want our leaders to do what we want and not what God wants. When we pray your kingdom come, we affirm that God is king. For the Lord Most High is awesome, the great king over all the earth. The Lord reigns and let the earth be glad. Let the distant shores rejoice. The Lord reigns, let the nation tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Jesus Christ is the ruler of the kings of the earth, and Lord of lords and King of kings. We who have trusted Jesus Christ are not only citizens of God's kingdom, but also children of the King. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of the Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you, pleased to give you the kingdom. The Father doesn't just give us a kingdom ID card or a kingdom address. He gives us the kingdom. 
And what kind of kingdom is it? My kingdom is not of this world. And Jesus told the Roman governor, governor Pilate, if it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Pilate was a Roman official, and when he heard the word kingdom, he thought in terms of authority, force, armies, and battles. But our Lord's kingdom doesn't follow the Roman pattern or example. Our example is Jesus Christ, not Julius Caesar. You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and Jesus taught the twelve and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Lord of man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus told a confused Nicodemus, that the only way to enter this kingdom of heaven was by believing on him and being born again. Because sin is reigning, that is reigning. But because Christ is reigning in heaven, grace is reigning. Jesus was a born king. The angels praised him, and royal star guided the Magi, who came from afar to pay homage to the king of the Jews. Jesus lived like a true king, not in pomp and splendor, but in humility and poverty. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. He was simply walk, walking about, healing a few, speaking to individuals and companions of them, of men. How unlike the kingdom makers today, Jesus displayed his kingship over wind and waves, schools of fish, physical diseases and deformities, and even demons. When he called men to follow him and serve God, they obeyed even though they must have felt frightened and inadequate. The kingdom laws that he un enunciated focused on love, humility, sacrifice, and forgiveness. His message was filled with paradoxes. The way to rise higher is to go lower. The way to lead is to serve. The way to receive is to give. The way to succeed is to seem to fail unlike many leaders. He practices with what he preached and brought glory to the Father. He died a king in full control of the situation. The soldiers crowned him with thorns and decked him in a mock coronation robe, bowing before him, anointing him with their spittle and saying, Hail, King of the Jews! The indictment displayed over his head on the cross was, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Death did not take him. He willed his own death, and in that death defeated death forever by the grace of God. Jesus tastes death for everyone. And Jesus proved his kingly victory by his resurrection from the dead, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold upon him. He ascended to heaven, the victorious king, and today is enthroned at the right hand of the Father. Today he is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. So Jesus is ministering to his church today as both king and priest. One day Christ will return as king of kings and lord of lords. He will defeat the enemies of truth and righteousness and usher in a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. In that wonderful 
new world. His servants will serve him, and they will reign forever and ever. If Jesus is the victorious king, why is this world so fragmented and fearful? And why is the church in such a disarray and seeming defeat? For the same reason that ancient Israel was divided and defeated, they rejected their heavenly king and asked for an earthly king, so they could imitate the godless nations. And instead of rejoicing that they were God's unique and special people, they imitated the pagan nations and sacrificed their distinctive witness. One mistake often leads to another. Israel rejected God the Father when they fired um, Samuel. And then Jesus came to earth, and Israel rejected God the Son, demanding that he be crucified. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered Pilate. The Holy Spirit came upon the church at Pentecost, and through the apostles and other believers brought salvation to thousands of people. But Israel's religious leaders rejected the witness of the Holy Spirit, culminating in the stoning of Stephen. Stephen said, as they conclude his message, You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Israel's rejections means the loss of their God, for the leaders had rejected the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Lord did not reject his people, but he returned from Israel to the Gentiles, fulfilling the words of Jesus. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce it, fruit. That people is a church, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possessions, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness in his wonderful light. Christians are a special people called to accomplish the special task of making Christ known throughout this dark and doomed world. The word translated declare in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 means to proclaim, to advertise. Our task as a chosen people is to advertise by our words and deeds the glorious virtues of Jesus Christ. We are to live and serve in such a way that others will want what we have in Jesus Christ. But how can the church advertise the virtues of Christ if the church is imitating the world? We have been called to shine as lights, not to reflect as mirrors. We don't belong to this world system, but to a heavenly counterculture that is hated by the same world system that hated Jesus and crucified him. This spiritual kingdom did not originate from the world, nor is it sustained by the world. If we pray, your kingdom come, while at the same time compromising with the world, we are hypocrites and our prayers will not be answered. If we sincerely pray your kingdom come, there are some conditions to meet. Our lives must be different from the life of the lost people and the careless Christians around us. People who really want Jesus to come and will look forward to his glorious kingdom will be guided by Paul's first letter to the Thessalonian church. Each chapter in this letter ends with a reference to the coming of Jesus Christ and tells us how we should live if we are sincerely looking for his coming. The Thessalonian believers turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, who rescued us from the coming wrath, we are worshiping and serving either the true and living God in heaven or the idols of this world. 
When these people turned to God, they also turned away from the useless idols they had worshipped, because they knew that no one can serve two masters. How subtle is Christian idol worship as we boast of our buildings, our finances, our accomplishments, and our statistics, instead of boasting in the Lord. First, Thessalonians chapter 2 ends with a description of the joy Paul anticipate when he would see his friends in heaven. For what is our hope, our joy? Or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of the Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Christians who want Jesus to come back are faithful witnesses who seek to reach others with the gospel. And what a tragedy it would be to go to heaven and have no one to greet you. At the end of chapter 3, the emphasis is on love and holiness. Verses 11 to 13, if we don't love others and live godly lives, why would we want Jesus to come back and find us in the state of disobedience? Our Lord's parable of the unfaithful servant tells us what happens to believers who mentally postpone Christ's coming and begin to abuse people and neglect their ministries. How can we long for his appearance if we don't walk in the line in the light and walk in love? Encouragement is the theme of the closing verse of First Thessalonians 4. The believers in Thessalonica were not having an easy time of it. The church was being persecuted and some of the believers had died. Paul assured them that when Jesus returned, their suffering would be turned to glorious and they would be reunited with their loved ones. This is the greatest comfort we have in the midst of suffering and sorrow. We must not see our Lord's return as an escape from burdens and battle, but as encouragement to keep on working and wearing because it is worth it. Paul's closing words in chapter 5 admonish us to live sanctified lives that are separated from sin and surrender to the Lord. All who have this hope in him, Christ, purify themselves just as he is pure. Praying your kingdom come involves more than simply uttering three words. It demands the devotion and dedication of our entire being to Jesus as we eagerly anticipate seeing him. Heaven is not simply a destination. It is a motivation because of the cross. All born-again Christians are ready to go to heaven, but not all are prepared for the judgment seat of Christ where we will all give an account of ourselves to God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive what is due them for the time done while in the body, whether good or bad. The next time we pray your kingdom come, we need to review our own lives. and ask whether we would really be happy if Jesus came back today or if you want him to come only to end our problems. During the three years of our Lord's ministry on earth, many people expected him to break the Roman yoke and establish the kingdom for Israel. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday, some of the people shouted, Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. He told the crowd the parable of the pounds, the minas, because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear of once 
After his resurrection, even the apostle asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus didn't deny the facts of the future kingdom. He merely told them they had other things to do first. Yes, Jesus will one day reign in his glorious kingdom. But only then he reigns in and through those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gifts of righteousness, who reigns in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God on earth is wherever the Son of God is loved and worshipped, and God the Father is glorified through obedience to his will. The gospel is the good news of the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ The second and third request in the Lord's Prayer to go together, Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Church history records the embarrassment of religious people who were sure they knew exactly when the Lord would be coming and would return, only to be proven wrong. This kind of prophetic Presumption started back in Paul's days, as recorded in 2 Thessalonians. Somebody brought a forged letter to the assembly in Thessalonica, claimed it was from Paul. It asserted that the day of the Lord had come and that the return of Jesus would shortly occur. Some of the saints believed this lie and quit their jobs to get ready to meet their soon coming Savior. But this meant they had to be fed by the believers who were still faithfully working for a living. In his letter, Paul untangled their theological confusion and then admonished the idle believers to get back to work. Jesus made it clear that his followers should be working while they are watching and waiting, for this is the best preparation for meeting the Lord at his return. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. This is balanced by anyone who is unwilling to work shall not eat. No matter where we live on this earth, we have to promise of the Lord's coming. But we also have the responsibility of obeying God's will and making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Since we are privileged to be citizens in God's kingdom right now, we must abandon our own kingdoms and make God's kingdom to only one we honor and serve. To limp between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world is to miss the best of both, according to Matthew. Your kingdom come implies that God rules first of all in our lives, and then through is us in the lives of others as we pray for them and minister to them. We want God's kingdom to rule in homes and families, in places of employment and ministries, in various government offices and agencies, and in places of authority and ministry around the world until Jesus comes again and establish the kingdom of glory. We can pray that his kingdom of grace will have great influence through this church. We have something to look forward to because Jesus is coming again. Your kingdom come is a prayer that he will answer as we wait and watch. Praying that prayer will keep us awake and alert. Someone to love means worshiping. Something to means working and witnessing. Something to look forward to means waiting and watching. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. My dear ones, 
We are citizenships of heaven. We are a royal priesthood. We are a chosen nation. Be proud of that and humble yourself before the Lord. Blessings to all of you, my dear ones. This is your Pastor Yeti. Bye.